I know a lot of folks had kind of a late night last night, and it's uh, still rather early in the morning today. So I, I have a little poll I want to take, but you don't get to raise your hand. You have to stand up. So uh, get ready to stand up. Um, I've been to all eight Ruby Confs, and uh, all of them have been fantastic, this one included. But I'm kind of curious, like, what the makeup is as far as uh, how many people. So first one I'd like to do is I'd like everyone who, if this is your very first Ruby Conf, stand up. All right, that is sweet. All right. Excellent, okay, you can sit down. If, you, if this is your first RubyConf, you can sit down. Huh? No, RailsConf doesn't count. I'm just, I'm just counting RubyConf this morning, sorry. Um, I've been to every American RailsConf so far, so maybe we can do that sometime at RailsConf. But, um, so now I'd like everyone who's been, uh, who this is your second RubyConf, it doesn't have to be in a row, um, but let's see, how do I want to do this? Yeah, so actually if, if you've been to two or more Ruby comps, this one included, go ahead and stand up. So this should be everybody else. Stand up. Now, if so, now if you if this is your second Ruby comp, then go ahead and sit down. Okay. If this is your third Ruby comp, go ahead and sit down. Okay. If this is your fourth RubyConf, go ahead and sit down. If this is your fifth RubyConf, you can go ahead and sit down. Same set of people. If this is your sixth RubyConf, go ahead and sit down. Seventh. <laughs> and now Paul and I are the only ones left standing. So. Um, the amazing thing to me is those guys that have been to all of them are still in the room, but um, as I've spoken at every RubyConf so far as well, um, some reason they keep coming back for more. I'm not sure why. Um, but this morning, having yet another opportunity to get to talk to you about um, whatever I want to, um, what I want to talk about is the fear of programming. So let's back up a little bit. This is a talk about making stuff. It's a talk about the act of creation. So we just had in this room, if you were in here, we had an, a great talk about um, Aristotle and the art of software development. And that was really more focused on philosophy. But I want to um, talk about coding as art and as creating. Um, I'm not going to debate with anyone whether software is engineering or art. I'm just going to say that a significant portion of what we do when we write code is art. And if it is art, then there's a lot of interesting things that we can learn from artists in terms of how they approach art. And in terms of, in particular, their emotional relationship with the art that they're creating. We're all software development guys. We're like, we're geeks, analytical, rational. We don't necessarily talk about emotions very much. But artists, they don't have any trouble, really. They just, they're very touchy-feely. Um, this is how I feel about what I'm creating, etc. cetera. And I'd, I'd like to step back for a minute. I hear a lot of talk um, and have heard a lot of talks that sort of talk around this issue of how emotions, and particularly the emotion of fear, affect us. We talk about procrastination and how to be more productive and how to hack our mind. But to actually go and deal directly with the emotion of fear and how it affects our development, I haven't seen very many conversations about that. And that's what I want this to be. I want this to be sort of a conversation. And I hope that everyone walks away with this <clears throat> Certainly with, I hope I can offer a few answers, but even more, I hope you walk away with some very key questions that you can apply um, as you're going through software development and that we'll begin having a conversation about more, more about how fear as an emotion affects our development. So, 
To start with, everyone has fears. Fear affects all of us. Um, we have this emotional reaction to um, what we're doing, I would say, on a daily basis. And usually it's, it's in the background. We don't even necessarily notice it. Um, and, and, and many times it's a healthy relationship that we have with it. It's something that we deal with. We move on, and it doesn't even affect us. But at the same time, we all have fears that do affect us, that affect our productivity. How many of you would like to be spending more time working on a side project that you have that you're really passionate about. Okay. And I would say that all of us, if we think about that side project, there is fear that affects our working or not working on those side projects and the amount of time that we spend on them. Um, it's certainly not the only factor. Certainly we have other constraints on our time, but at the same time we make regular decisions about what we're going to spend time on. And I think that fear is a very significant emotion that affects whether or not we do those things. So everyone has fears, but everyone has different fears. And fears affect us in different ways. Um, let's talk about a few different fears that might affect coding. First one would be, um, say, the fear of a blank page. So, okay, I want to start working on this project, but I'm in a fresh directory, I have an empty editor with a blinking cursor, how do I get started? And the interesting thing about fear a lot of times is you actually won't even necessarily get to that point because you already are afraid of getting to that point, so you don't even go to start the project because you know you'll have to encounter the blank page. Another fear might be um, a fear of existing code. How many of you have seen existing code that you're afraid of? Well, actually, there's two ways. So the obvious way is legacy code, yucky code, that you're looking at and you're thinking, oh, man, if I have to maintain this. It might even be code that you wrote. It, man, if I have to deal with this, if I have to maintain this, I am, I, like, you get that feeling in your gut, like, oh, no. But the flip side of that, you can be afraid of really nice existing code and not want to contribute to a project because you're afraid that you're going to get in there and mess things up. So you can have, there can be um, really beautiful code and I'm afraid that I'm going to get in there and, and write bad code. And so that's another way that you can be afraid of existing code. Um, and along those same lines, just in general, the fear of writing bad code. The fear that you might sit down to create and you might create something that you don't respect, that you don't like, or that you think that when you show it to other people, they will not appreciate it. Usually, if you are afraid that you will show it to other people and that they will not appreciate it, it's because you yourself somehow have an interaction with that code emotionally that you don't completely respect it. And a lot of times, again, this is something that can affect you before you even write the code. So you never write code because you're afraid that the code that you write would be bad. Another fear might be a fear of not finishing. So if I start this project, I've started five projects in the past, and none of them are finished. And if I start another project, it's just going to be another failure. I'm not going to finish it. So you can have this fear where you never start anything because you're afraid that you might not be able to finish it. Now, an interesting corollary to that, and I see this especially as sort of a, a, an organizational fear in large organizations, is a fear of finishing. How many six-month projects turn into 18-month projects because everybody's afraid to actually call it and say we're done and we ought to be done and we need to push this out? So there can also be a fear of finishing. Even just you working on your side project, it's easy to hack away on a side project for months when you could have released very soon after you began. But be, there's that fear of having to push it out and have other people encounter it and, and what they'll say and, and the different issues that will come up when you actually get real with it. So now what I want to do is dig into this a little bit more. What other fears have you encountered in, when you approach code? So, uh, try that. Um, sure. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm not excited about programming anymore. Kind of burnout. Okay. So a, a, a fear that programming is just not going to be fun anymore. Who else? <laughs> I'm 
when I have just a few minutes at, uh, at a time during a day. Uh, I guess the problem I have is sometimes I'm afraid I'm not going to finish what I start in those few minutes and I don't want to start something and, and then leave it when the test is still failing or when it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Okay, is this, is this mic on? Yeah, it is on. Um, yeah, so that was a fear of sort of not finishing but in the small. So you've got a few minutes, but you don't start because you're afraid that in those few minutes you won't be able to finish. Fear that what I'm doing doesn't actually help anyone or isn't interesting to people, that what I'm doing is actually meaningless. Right. Fear of commitment, something getting eclipsed three seconds after you release it, and then like, do I maintain this? Do I, you know, start recommending something else, or how does that go? Excellent. We're all on the couch. I tend to be afraid that I'm going to do something not the right way, that I'm going to waste time reimplementing the wheel mm -hmm. and not finding like the the one method call that would make it all work perfectly. Right. Absolutely. Um, I'm often afraid that when I go to investigate the patches that people have given me, these are things they felt passionate about, they've taken time to make a patch, I'm afraid of saying no to them. So often I'll avoid going through my patch list for that reason. Gotcha. <laughs> I can totally understand that. Uh, I had the fear of committing time to the project on a consistent basis. Anybody else? Burning fear that affects you when you're going to code. Um, I'm afraid of all the extra work aside from programming that it takes to um, make a project successful. Excellent. One more. Do you have another one? Okay. No? I, I'm afraid that my imagination uh, outreaches my ability. I've definitely felt that before. So there's all these different fears that affect us and keep us from cause us to avoid what we know that we want to do, what we believe would be the most satisfying. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even encounter the fear if you didn't want to do the thing, right? And so you must believe at some level that that activity would be satisfying. And yet, these fears keep us back from approaching that. So... And the other, I guess the other point that I have about fear, and this is something I read, I didn't come up with this myself, but you, there are both fears about others, which is the one that we often think of. Well, if I publish this, I'm afraid of what others will think of it and think of me. But there's also fears about yourself. There's those times when you, you, want, you go to do something and you're afraid of sort of whether you'll respect yourself after you do it. Well, I'm, if I write this code, it might be bad code. Nobody else might ever see it, but I'm still afraid that I won't like it, and therefore I'm not going to approach it. So fear about others, fear about self. Here is the key point of this whole talk. So if you walk away with nothing else, you can just like grab this piece. Um, this is what I want to communicate. All fears are legitimate. Okay? They are legitimate. Because what you have to understand is what fear is. Fear is a warning mechanism. That's all it is. It's a flag. It's, it's an emotional warning mechanism. It's basically your memories. You have your memories of past experiences. And those build up to a point where you've learned different things. And part of the way that that comes out, okay, I experienced pain in the past due to something or something around this thing. And so now I am afraid to approach it. The key, the, the, the thing that we have to understand is that they are just a warning mechanism. They're really great as a warning. Fear is really great as a warning mechanism. It's really pathetic as a decision maker. And so it's not that the fears are illegitimate or that we want to have no fear. Rather, it's that we want to take fear elevate it to a level of conscious thought, think r rationally, logically about it, and then make a, a, a decision. 
versus approaching a situation, feeling that gut feeling of, oh no, and just, deci- just deflecting a different direction without even ever thinking about that reaction. And so often our fear happens at this low uh, emotional level. We don't even necessarily recognize that we're making a decision simply based on this emotional reaction. And so what we need to do is, is look for this and watch for it and elevate it up to the point where we can make a conscious decision about the, the thing that we're afraid of. So, one analogy to help us think about this, and it really helps me think about it a lot. Pain, or I'm sorry, fear is to your mind as pain is to your body. Right? So there is an actual um, medical disorder in which people cannot feel pain. They, they have no ability to feel pain. It's a very incredibly dangerous disorder to have because you can be in a situation where you basically stick your hand onto a hot stove and like lean on it for minutes at a time and never realize the damage that you're doing to your body until you pick up the blackened stump, right? It's very dangerous to not be able to feel pain. And pain is an important mechanism that, you, that we use on a regular basis to uh, inform our decisions about what we're going to do and what we're not. Well, in the same way, fear is this important mechanism that we have that warns us, okay, well, last time I took on this uh, ugly legacy code from someone and tried to maintain it, it was really painful. I shouldn't do that again. Right? Or to take it back to a much more basic level, a child touches a hot stove for the first time and goes, ow, that hurt. Right? If they don't learn fear from that, they'll continue to do it over and over and over again, continue to injure themselves. So fear does serve a very valid purpose in the same way that pain does to warn us. At the same time, pain makes a very bad decision maker because one of the best <clears throat> things that you can do for your body one that most of us, myself included, probably do not do nearly enough of, is exercise. And what, what does exercise do? Exercise hurts, right? If you spent your, all your time working to avoid pain with your body, there's a lot of wonderful things that you would never experience. You would never go mountain biking or biking at all because you might fall off the bike and you might get hurt. And in the same way, we, we don't touch the stove over and over again, but we do choose to do um, some things regardless of the pain involved, such as exercise or such as do things that have the risk of pain. And with fear, there are some things that you're afraid of and you ought to be afraid of them. And you ought to let that fear be a very strong factor in your decision making to avoid doing that thing ever again. But at the same time, you want to make those conscious decisions and not simply something where you're making your decisions completely out of your gut and saying, oh, that, that's, I'm, I'm afraid of that, so I'm just, I'm not even going to go close to it. So, what are the tools that we can use to move beyond making these decisions based on our fear and make, elevate them to a, a rational, logical process that we're making with our mind. I think there are two key tools that we have in order to do that. The first tool is more learning, more knowledge, more wisdom. One of the, the, the biggest, I'd say, One of the most detrimental fears that we can have, and one that we ought to uh, fight in every way that we can. I don't think it's ever, um, I won't say that it's ever a legitimate fear, but it's almost never a legitimate fear, at least. And that is the fear of the unknown. And so many times when we're, at, when we're afraid of something, it's not even, like, we don't even know what we're afraid of. It's just this big amorphous blob. And I'm afraid of that, that thing, right? It's an emotional reaction. It's not a rational reaction. And so you, you haven't differentiated yet what you're actually afraid of. And so if you can 
basically learn more about that. So the first way that knowledge helps us is by learning more about the thing that we're afraid of. So when you first decided to take on Ruby, I'm betting there was some fear involved with that move. What if I go after, and you probably don't even remember all of it, but what if I decide to take on this new language and it, it's not successful? I spend a whole bunch of time and nobody else is using it and it's just me all by myself. What if I take on this new language and I'm no good at it or I hate it? Um, there's all these fears around it. And so, but if you want to learn a new language, what do you do? You start experimenting with it. You dabble with it a little bit. You don't have to commit the next five years of your life to it. What you're trying to do is get enough of an understanding to eliminate the unknowns. Well, okay, I'm afraid that nobody else is using Ruby. So what could you do? You could go and learn and do a little bit of research to figure out who else is using Ruby. And all of a sudden that is eliminated as an unknown and you can continue to focus down and learn more. So very often, knowledge is a direct antidote to fear, particularly if you're dealing with a fear of the unknown, which is one of the most detrimental ones. Um, the other way that learning really helps with dealing with fear is sometimes you're going to encounter a fear, you're going to elevate it to your, your conscious thinking. You're going to go, oh, I'm afraid of this. And I know exactly what I'm afraid I'm, I've, I've, I've learned enough about the fear, um, the thing that I'm afraid of, to kind of know what it is that I'm afraid of. And I'm, I've decided that it's worth doing. So I am going to pursue this thing regardless of the fact that I'm afraid of it. Well, the, the thing is, the, the fear... Um, emotional reaction, it doesn't just instantly go away because you've decided um, to disregard it and plow on. It's still there. And there's a whole bunch of techniques that you can use to get through that regardless because it's still going to continue to affect you. So what are some of those techniques? Well, as coders, one of the ones that um, probably most of us, I hope all of us, are familiar with is testing. Right? Testing is a wonderful antidote to fear. When you've decided to take on that ugly piece of legacy code and you have to go in and change it, what's, you can take tests, surround it with tests, strangle it with tests to the point where you're confident then to go in and change it without worrying about breaking it nine ways from Monday. Um, also, testing is a great way, and it, it sort of ties in with another technique. It, testing is a great way to break a problem down. So a lot of times when you're afraid of a problem, right, it's this big, hairy thing. Well, big, hairy problems are made up of little, fuzzy problems. And the little, fuzzy problems are much easier to tackle. When you're looking at that blank page and going, oh, man, how in the world am I going to get started on this? It helps a lot to say, well, could I write one test? Well, yeah, I could, I could write one test. So you write one test, and it breaks. Could I make that test pass? Well, yeah, I could make that test pass. Go and make the test pass. And so you incrementally move through breaking the problem down into small steps, and it becomes much more approachable. I mean, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And so, and, and not just in testing, but just in general, when you're afraid of something, breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces is a great way to tackle that fear. So break it down until you're dealing with pieces and with problems that are small enough that you, you can't really be afraid of them, right? Or you're not nearly as afraid of them. And so you, at that point, have enough motivation to get past that. And as, the thing is, once you take that approach and you start working through those smaller problems, all of a sudden you'll go, oh wow, I'm not really afraid of this anymore. You start to build up momentum, you get in the zone, and all of a sudden you're through the thing that you were afraid of. Um, another one would, very coding specific, that I've used before is to prototype something. So I'm afraid of this thing. I'm afraid in particular that I don't understand the problem well enough to write good code around it. I'm afraid that I'm going to write code that is going to be really ugly, and then I'm going to end up having to maintain that really ugly code. Well, my one technique that I've used for that is prototyping something and forcing myself to throw it away when I'm done. 
basically saying, okay, I got four hours, I'm going to hack on this thing. Maybe I'm not even going to write tests. I'm just going to hack on this thing, understand the problem better, and force myself at the end of that to chuck it. And then all of a sudden that frees you up from the fear of creating bad code, the fear of not understanding the problem well enough, etc. You just have given yourself freedom to, um, to tackle the problem in a constrained way. And an interesting thing, so I gave this talk at the local Ruby Brigade last month, and we had just a fantastic discussion afterwards about things. And one of the things that kind of came out of the discussion is a lot, one of the real antidotes to fear is setting yourself boundaries, right? It's the big things that, make, that, that can be so scary. It's that amorphous thing of, oh, I should work on this side project but you haven't really broken it down into what you should do on that side project. And setting yourself constraints, basically building your own set of fences, it gives you the comfort then to move into that thing. And prototyping with force trashing would be a way to do that. Um, another one, and this is, this is one of my favorite techniques actually, um, and I use it not just in coding, but um, in other things as well, and that is doing worst case scenarios. What is the worst thing that could happen if, I, if, if this fear was realized? Well, you know, okay, I'm afraid that I'm going to start working on this project and I'm not going to finish it. So what's the worst? Well, I'd spend a whole bunch of time working on something and it, 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 would, it would basically go for nothing. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of bad. I mean, it would be better to work on something that you would get more results out of, but at the same time, it's not going to kill you, right? You won't be dead. So if you can take that worst case scenario, now, the one thing I will say is, you're all pretty creative people, so you don't want to get too creative when you do worst case scenarios. I mean, I could probably work up a scenario under which not finishing a project might result in my death. So you don't want to get quite that creative. But at the same time, you know, apply, apply a, a good amount of reasoning skills to saying what is the worst thing? And it might be really bad, right? It, but it probably doesn't result in imminent death. Um, I've heard a lot of people in the business arena, very successful businessmen, say the best thing that ever happened to me was losing everything, right? They were in business and they lost everything. They lost their shirt. But it was the best thing that ever happened to them because then they knew in business nothing, like they survived the worst thing that could ever happen. And so they were free then to go and take risks because they knew that even if their worst fears were realized, they would come through, they would learn something, and they'd be able to start over. So doing worst case scenarios. And then the other thing that I would recommend is there are some really good books. There's one book in particular, The War of Art. Um, an excellent book by a writer about um, art in particular. He talks a lot about writing. And, and what he has found is necessary in writing. Um, it's an excellent book. It's like this thick. It's really quick read. I read it on an airplane one time. But it will change your thinking. I'd highly recommend it. The other book that I read um, is a book called Art and Fear. Also good. If you read The War of Art and you still want more, then I'd suggest reading Art and Fear. It is, it, it's basically it's from two artists collaborating and talking a lot about the fear that we encounter when we go to create something and ways to mitigate that fear. Okay, now I'd like to hear from all of you what some of your techniques are to go through fear. When you've decided that something is worth doing, how do you, how do you move through that? Because I know there are some really productive people in this room, way more productive than I am, so I want all your tips and tricks. Honestly, pair programming is one of those things that helps me deal with it. Uh, I, well, the first time I paired, uh, I sat with someone who had more experience than I did, and I thought that they were just going to see me for the fraud that I was. And um, when I was able to get past that and, and get past that exhilaration at first, where you're afraid of coding with someone, um, they, I was getting feedback from them and I was learning. And I realized that I did know a few things that this other person didn't know. And that helped me build confidence in myself and in my work and uh, build confidence in the other person. So I think that pairing really helps. So I'd recommend that. Absolutely. I found that as well. So here. What I tend to do is I'll try and explain my idea to someone, and especially to someone who doesn't understand programming at all. 
And like my wife, I spent many, many hours explaining a problem, explaining 20 different solutions. And through the repetitiveness of it, I'll teach myself what is the best way to approach this problem. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, what, one thing I do to uh, address the fear is try to identify what is the, the scariest or the biggest, most uncertain part of the project and try to prove a solution to that first. And then you feel like everything is more downhill after that. Right. Couldn't be any worse than what I already did. Yeah, this is not specific to programming, but I find it extremely useful to write down my fears on paper and ask myself why I have them. Excellent. And sometimes talk about them out loud with somebody else, too. Excellent. I'm just going to keep working back this way. I saw some hands back here. Back here. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> It's interesting, actually, that everyone who's answering this question is coming up with kind of upbeat, positive ways that they've handled their fears. I think there's also a, a dark side to this. Um, I mean, one thing, for example, that I think of is the, I, I mean, I, I hope it's more just kind of an impulse and I don't really act on it too much, but for example, with musical projects, um, name, you know, sort of upcoming concerts, this feeling that, you know, I can at some level handle my fear by not practicing, so I'll have kind of an excuse. And of course, that does, that's not real, you know, the people in the audience won't know that, but there's this kind of weird kind of inverse comfort to thinking, well, you know, of course I won't play well, I haven't been, you know, and of course, and then you ha that's the solution to the fear, but then you have to fight that. In other words, not every solution to the fear is itself productive and, right. and positive, and that's something to watch for, too. Right, absolutely, yeah, I mean, the goal is to to do the things that satisfy you, that you know at some level will be satisfying. So who over here we have? That one up there. There you go. Um, I do two things. If something's like really intimidating me or frustrating me, I get up and take a walk. And usually by the time I get all the way around the block, it's not a big deal anymore. Um, the other thing is if I have a really short period of time and I'm worried that I'm gonna get into something and not solve it, I write some failing test cases. Like, I focus the time only on writing the test cases. I don't try and solve the problem. And I, you know, sit down to code. Like, I used to ride the train all the time, so I have 30 minutes, right? You write failing test cases during that time, and then when you get into the office, you know exactly where you were. Because it says so right there on the screen. Right. So what do you do when you don't know how to write the test? <laughs> what do you mean? Like, if you don't know what test to write. In other words, you're not sure how to test the problem. If you haven't designed the issue yet, then usually it's time to sit down with a piece of paper and, and just play with it and try and get some idea of you know what's the flow going to look like. What you know if it's a user interface, what does the wireframe look like? If it's you know a system level interface, like how is it really kind of function? And just do the mind map and get everything out and get an idea of like what does it look like from the user's perspective or what does it look like from the interface perspective? Cool. Somebody else? Okay. One thing I'm afraid of is that my code, after I've first written it, won't work, which typically it doesn't. Uh, so what I find is that, that helps me is to actually just take a deep breath and press return and just do it. Yeah. There's definitely something for just leaping. It's interesting, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, worst case scenario, because uh, in a corporate environment, there's actually a very formal process, what they call risk management, which involves documenting the risk, evaluating the, the um, chances, the probability of it coming to fruition, and then documenting how to mitigate the risk, but also how to respond to it if it does in fact occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely didn't come up with worst case scenario. <laughs> it's cool, I borrowed. It's kind of weird to me that I'm more accountable to other people than I am to myself. Like, if I have a deadline at work, I tend to meet it, but if it's something I want to do for myself, I'll put it off and off and off. 
And I've tried a lot of these things. The one that you mentioned, the one about breaking it into little steps, that worked the best for me until I started getting even smaller and smaller. And I tend to stop, right? And it's the same thing as what the gentleman back there said about the music. I guess it's in high school, if you take a test, you don't study. It doesn't reflect on you because you didn't study for it, so you don't feel bad. And it's the same idea with music. But I don't really know what works. <laughs> That's why I'm here. But I love some of the ideas. And, and I don't, um, I, I'd love to understand why I'm more accountable to other people than I am to myself. That's so I'd have a theory about that, actually. I, one of the ways to overcome a fear is to be more afraid of something else, right? So if you, you reach that point in a project where you're procrastinating on something because you're afraid of it, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, the client is going to come after me. Like, this is really going to hurt. So now I'm going to work on the thing, right? But seriously, it's this, it's this scales, and all of a sudden the fear of the client becomes greater than the fear of whatever it is that you're trying to do. But I think that that is somewhat... It works in, to, in some sense. But I don't think that behave, like acting be, out of fear is the right way to act. Because you're still at that point, like we don't even recognize that that's what's happening, and you're still at that point making your decision based on the gut feeling and not actually bringing it up and making a rational decision. And it means that you don't do your most satisfying work. So Carl has something back here. Let's see what he has to say. Oh, yeah. Ow. Oh. All right. So. I've been reading a book, great book I would recommend to everyone, um, called uh, The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. And he talks about, he quotes Carl Jung, who said that um, neurosis is um, always a substitute for legitimate suffering. So what we do is, if we're afraid of something, we create some sort of neurosis to cope with that fear. But what often happens is that the neurosis actually becomes worse than the original thing that we were trying to avoid the original pain we were trying to avoid. And sometimes you can actually create layer upon layer of neurosis. In fact, almost everybody has this. And he recommends that we should have no fear of going into therapy because, uh, probably because he's a psychiatrist and oh, makes yeah. money off of, the, <laughs> off of it. But also because like everybody, no matter how well adjusted they seem to be, actually could benefit from being able to analyze and discuss their life with someone else and uh, try to see ways in which they do things that cause, cause themselves harm, you know? Right. And I think that, um, that uh, it was brought up here a little bit of that where like the, the not practicing was sort of a neurosis for, um, you know, actually preparing for the event. And I think that um, if we look hard, we can see a lot of ways in which we do that in our daily behavior, just to comment basically. Yeah, absolutely. Last one. Um, one of the things I do is uh, pray. I mean, when you lift these things up to the God of the universe, it's uh, fears seem pretty small. So that's for anybody. All right. So there are lots of techniques for uh, that you, we can learn to help to overcome fear, to do our most satisfying work. Right? I mean, the 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 real problem that I see with acting out of fear is that what. Well, and it really gets down to the next tool. So more knowledge, more learning. But the other tool that we have for combating fear, and I actually think the more powerful tool for combating fear, the most powerful tool we have is love. I was so pleased when Moss brought up love in his keynote because now I feel a little less funny saying it. But seriously, like I think that love is actually the ultimate antidote to fear because when... We make decisions based on fear. It's much better to make decisions based on passion for what you're doing, right? What happens is, like you were saying, you, you, don't, you work on the projects at work because you're accountable to other people, but you don't work on your side projects. Well, you're completely missing the fact that what you want to do is, is put your, pour yourself into the things that you love, into the things that you enjoy, into the things that you're passionate about. And if you have that passion for something, it allows you to go through, it gives you the motivation to go through the things that you fear. If you're not passionate, 
Why would you, why would you even bother with going through the things with, that, you, that you're afraid of? What's the point? And so to do your most satisfying work, what you want to do is be motivated by your passion, by the things that you're excited about, by the things that you love. And so more love is, is sort of the, the ultimate antidote to fear. And, you know, this is sort of, if, if there was a hill, if, if, if we were fighting over hills, this is one that I would die on. And that is that I can't think of anything more tragic. Well, I can think of a few things more tragic. Okay. Um, <laughs> one of the biggest tragedies that I can think of is someone going through life not doing the things that they're passionate about. Because I believe people were made to do specific things. And if you're not doing the things that you were made to do that you're passionate about, then what's the point? Why are you doing anything? So, and if you do find that thing, that thing that you're passionate about, I mean, in particular, we're talking about sort of your, your work life, your, the, and I think that, that work is a good thing. If we're talking about the things that you choose to put your hand to day in and day out, you want to be, you're not going to have overpowering issues with fear if you stay focused on your love for the things that you're doing. If you're passionate about what you're doing, then you go, oh, that's scary, but I don't care because I want to do this. I love to do this, and I'm going to keep doing it, and nobody's going to stop me. And a lot of times the issue is that our fears build up, and we don't even recognize that we've lost our passion for something. And if we'll, again, if we'll, if we'll recognize those fears saying, oh, you know, those are great indicators that you've approached your passion probably in some wrong ways in the past, ways that didn't work. But at the same time, what you want to do is recapture that passion. This is what I love to do. I love to code. I love to create things, to make things, to solve problems. And so recapturing that gives you a, a powerful force to just run right through the fears. And that's something I, I actually found um, last year. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of exploration into, into business, and it's still something that I'm really interested in and I'm learning a lot about, but I'm also passionate about making things and particularly writing code. And I kind of lost my passion for everything because I'd allowed myself to move away from that. And so rediscovering that passion, reinvigorating my passion for code, actually reinvigorated just about everything that I was doing and allowed me to move past fears that I was having across all kinds of different areas. So finding your passion and pursuing it is key. The other part of more love in um, conquering fear is having people around you that love you and that you know love you. I mean, what's the cliche? I made a website and my mom checked it out and she loved it, right? But it's true. I mean, it's a cliche because it's true. We, our moms empower us. I hope you had a mother that empowered you by loving you no matter what you did, succeed or fail. And in the same way, that is a, a powerful antidote to fear, knowing that there's somebody, whether you succeed or fail, whether your fear is completely realized, knowing that somebody loves you and regardless of that. And also having those people around you that you know respect you and will tell you when you're off the track. But you know that they're not attacking you personally. They're trying to make you better. So, all fears are legitimate. They're just warning signs, and we ought to use them as such to make decisions. Um, we need to move beyond them, make decisions, decide when we ought to abandon a path based on a fear, and also decide when we're going to go through them. And the tools that we have are more learning and more love. So, that is fear programming. I hope it's helpful. Um, I'd love any feedback that you have. I'm not sure. Let me check the time here. So, we have some time. Um, no, we're out of time. So, thank you. Thank you.